I'm Dr. Vanessa Sinclair, and this is Rendering Unconscious. My guest today is Dr. Katherine Marshall Woods, a clinical psychologist in private practice in downtown Washington, D.C. She is also director of psychology at a local mental health hospital and a consultant working with actors, screenwriters, producers, and directors on theme and character development and set accuracy. She has an interest in psychological assessment, trauma, diversity, clinical supervision, and the intersection between psychology and film and media. Rendering Unconscious is also a book. Rendering Unconscious, Psychoanalytic Perspectives, Politics, and Poetry. Available from Trapart Books, 2019. Please visit our publisher's website, www.trapart.net. You can support the podcast by visiting our Patreon, p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash V A N E S S A two three C A R L. Your support is greatly appreciated. For more information, you can visit my website, drvanessasinclair.net, or the podcast website, renderingunconscious.org. My name is Dr. Catherine Marshall Woods. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist in Washington, D.C. Here I wear a lot of different hats. Um, I work at GW University in D.C. where um, I teach psychological assessment as well as trauma classes. Um, There I also supervise students in their clinical work to become doctors in the field. Um, I also am employed at the smallest mental health hospital in D.C. and only privately owned one. It's called Psychiatric Institute of Washington, where I'm the director of psychology there. I also arrange the psychological services at that hospital, and we work with numerous students to provide them clinical experiences in order to enhance their um, skill set and work with them on their journey to also become psychologists, which is a fantastic experience. Um, I've been pretty fortunate to also have a private practice where I treat individuals um, of all ages, um, as well as provide psychological assessments. Um, I certainly enjoy um, performing the psychological evaluations to learn more about people. And the last aspect of my um, work is really writing and working with screenwriters, directors, and producers on their, on their work, um, specifically on the production of ensuring that their characters within their films are rich characters that portray accurately the human condition. Um, if there are psychological disorders, um, ensuring that those disorders are also um, experienced in an an authentic manner. Um, And that's really been the highlight of my career, I feel. Yeah, that's really great because I I saw that you have a book coming out about different films uh, and psychologically minded. And it's really important because um, I feel like a lot of times when you see therapists portrayed and also people suffering from mental illnesses, um, it's never really accurate or therapists are really doing a bad job. (laughs) (laughs) Agreed. Um, um, That certainly was a motivation for me to get into this sort of um, aspect of the field. Um, I have an arts background, so this was a nice marriage for me. Um, And when I, you know, someone once came to me at a holiday party, actually, and said, Kat, if you could do anything you wanted to do in the field of psychology, what would you want to do? 
And I had never been asked that question um, throughout. And I had been in the field for more than a decade at that time. And I said, you know, I'd really like to write about psychology and film. And he probed a little more as most psychologists do. And, um, you know, he said, well, I have someone for you to meet. And at that time, um, American Psychological Association had a journal that was called Psych Critiques. And there you had an opportunity to write about the psychological dynamics found within film. And so I felt like I had hit the jackpot, like this is it. Um, And so I was sent to the movies and I was sent to write and it was a perfect fit for me. And so after I wrote several articles, um, the same individual said, I think it's time for you to write a book. Um, Best Psychology in Film was um, created and um, it came out in 2019. And what kind of films did you write about? So at that time in 2018, the Oscars had, um, at least here in America, had a lot of buzz regarding the fact that many of the films that were chosen and selected as contenders were more diverse um, with um, actors, um, even plots and themes of their films. So I took those films that the Oscars recognized as nominees at that point in time because of the level of diversity in the films. And I wrote about the psychological dynamics found within them, um, within the films itself, as well as the characters who were being recognized for best supporting actress and actor and um, best lead as well. Um, and so the, the book explores really how Every single film that really none of these films have like they're not psychological thrillers or have a psychological plot at all. Um, but the point is, is that with every single thing that you watch and you take in when it comes to media, there are are psychological dynamics at play. I mean, I truly believe psychology is all around us in every moment of our lives, whether it's with other people um, that we're interacting with or even when we're sitting in solitude, psychological dynamics are happening. And so that was the goal to be able to um, bring to light and elucidate for the reader what psychological dynamics they were seeing when they were watching these films. Yeah, and I read that you like to write or speak in a way that's accessible so that a more general audience can access these kinds of concepts. Yes, my goal is, honestly, I love to speak to other psychologists and other budding psychologists, um, but really my goal in my career is really to bring psychology to everyone. Um, Historically, I feel like psychology has had this sort of mystery um, to it. Um, What is it? Many people even may be afraid of it, especially to go to a therapist or receive counseling services of any sort. Um, And my real goal is to be able to make it um, something that's just in our general language and our general awareness, just like going to a primary care physician once a year or your OBGYN is something you do every year is being able to think about your mental health, um, hopefully more than every year, but um, at least every year that you're thinking about your mental health health. And I say those as two separate words um, to be able to really um, be able to put that at your radar and your forefront, that that's an important aspect of who you are and what makes you who you are. Yeah, exactly. I I hope the same and that it's like, you know, it's just commonplace. Like you said, like going to the doctor or going to the gym, you just like take care of your health in, in that way as well. Yes, absolutely. I truly feel that many individuals, you know, we're going through the daily requirements of life. And most of those things are stressors. You know, we work, we eat, we have to plan foods that are healthy for us. Hopefully, if we have time for that, there's child care, there's pet care, there's, you know, parent care if they're ill or sickly. So 
generally we're the last people that we attend to um, on a daily basis. And we're not even talking about the other sorts of tasks like cleaning the house and all of those other um, demands that we have. And, and so my, again, goal is for individuals to at least be thoughtful regarding what is happening within myself. And if I am experiencing something that makes me feel differently, well, let me take the time to be able to think about what may be happening um, with me at this time. And do I need support? Is that when I reach out for help? Um, That this sort of um, train of thought is just a normal aspect of people's ability to be able to link in with themselves rather than just keep going with the daily grind. Yeah, exactly. And I uh, always think of it as like, instead of just trying to suppress it or people thinking that there's something wrong with them, instead of trying to listen and figure out like what's going on with them that they could attend to, to help themselves feel better. Yes, exactly. Um, I definitely feel like individuals have this opportunity to just slow down um, and to be able to take an inventory of what's happening with them. And if they find out that something isn't typical for them, and I'm not going to say right or wrong, but typical for them, that that's actually okay. I mean, I feel like our feelings are useful um, tools for us to be able to use, to be able to signal, okay, I'm feeling anxious. Well, what's happening right now? Should I be feeling anxious? And in some situations, you ought. There are situations in life where anxiety is very helpful. It keeps us alive many times. What is signal anxiety? It tells us we are in a place where something is a threat or it's dangerous. And wanting to suppress that or push it down actually isn't going to help us at all. It's actually potentially harmful for us instead. And so even though these feelings are uncomfortable, they're actually ways for our body to tell us what's going on and our mind to tell us what's going on so we can hopefully make decisions that we are happy with the outcomes. Yeah, that's a beautiful way to put it. And um yeah, and teaching people to just ignore that or suppress it or try to get rid of it is like essentially teaching them to kind of ignore their own internal uh, experience and what which they should be listening to. Yes, agreed. I think that when individuals are asked to suppress or to even deny what they're going through, you know, we then wonder and have, you know, individuals come to us and say, you know, I don't feel like I'm moving forward in life or I feel like I'm stuck or I don't feel like I have an opportunity to be myself. And I feel like every time an individual does um, either ignore or avoid or deny or suppress those emotions is one more opportunity this individual is suppressing their true self. And I think, you know, in life, It's a pleasure, it's a privilege to be able to have the opportunity to be your true self. And, you know, I go back to my mentor who asked me if I could do anything I wanted to in my field. And he was giving me really the opportunity for me to do a self-examination of who am I personally and who am I in the field of psychology and how can I marry the both so when I am a psychologist, I can be my true self. So then while I'm being a psychologist, I can be part of my happiest self and most fulfilled self. And when I think about him asking that one question, what a gift that was to be able to offer me the ability to say, who are you? And I want to ensure that you're that person every day that you're doing this work. It's beautiful. Um, Yeah, and I think that gets lost a lot when people are trained to be psychologists and psychoanalysts because you're taught so much to kind of be this kind of blank slate and to just kind of reflect the other person. And I think, at least for me, but I think maybe a lot of people go into the field because they kind of had that natural way of being anyway. So it was like a way to kind of facilitate that. But then uh, what I learned over time is that it actually ended up not being so great for me to always just be a reflection for the other person. And I had 
had to go through this kind of process after psychoanalytic training of like reintegrating myself and being able to kind of be, have a personality and still do the work, you know? <laughs> yeah, I feel the same way. The tabula rasa, right? That's what we're taught in, in school is to reflect the person in, in allow that person to be able to project things upon us and, and how useful that is. And then there, are, and that works perfectly for some patients. And then for others, it doesn't work as well, that they need a more active approach. Um, and so knowing who you are to be able to really present to them authentically um, is going to actually, to me, benefit their, their treatment as well. And, I honestly feel like that was another reason why I needed a different way to express psychology um, rather than just in the therapy room with my patients is that I needed a space to be um, more of the creative artist. Um, And that's one reason too, why I went to work um, in film and production. Um, Now, granted, I am very much an advocate that psychology is a science and an art. Um, The ability to hear people and to be able to think about theory and then produce something that is eloquent and of service to your patients is certainly, I feel like, an art form. If you're looking at psychological data, I think being able to interpret that is an art form even. So I certainly am not taking that away. And I also felt that um, as an artist myself, I needed a space to be around other creatives and artists. Um, And so um, being able to still use psychology in film um, and media has also been a way of fulfilling my whole self and honoring that part of me. Yeah, and I really love psychological testing as well. Uh, when I was in the States, that was a big part of my my practice as well. And I found it, I don't know, it's just so fascinating. I love it. Um, the, the idea of being able to use these tools that are standardized that we use for everyone who are who's looking to have a psychological evaluation and the data that it yields and how different it is and nuanced um, it can be based upon who the person is, um, is just to me fascinating. Um, if a person likes puzzles is to me the best way to solve a puzzle um, in a specific amount of time, of course, um, for your patients. Um, and I also... I'm so um, lucky to have the experience that during um, feedback sessions with patients who receive psychological testings, you know, the best thing to hear is, wow, this really sounds like me or, wow, I never thought of myself this way. So the service that it provides to patients to me is also a true honor to be able to offer them that, that service. And Laura, Laura sent me, uh, Laura Sheehy, uh, Laura sent me an article that you had written recently, and it was such a beautiful piece talking about your experience going to uh, give this presentation before uh, the screening of the film Get Out, Um, and the whole kind of process of that. Would you want to talk about that song? (laughs) I'm... um... Uh, when you said she gave you an article, I was like, oh my goodness. Which um, one? <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, even though I write, I I always write in my head and say no one's going to read it, which gives me the courage to write what I write. Um, <laughs> um, so yes, um, I present on psychological film with other psychologists. Um, one aspect of my work at GW is that we've... Um, begun to collaborate with the Washington Baltimore Center for Psychoanalysis as well, where we provide film series. But that evening that I wrote about was actually with the Washington School of Psychiatry in DC, where they have a film series as well. And I was the presenter of the film Get Out um, to, again, be able to talk about the um, psychological dynamics found within the film in particular and atypical, I feel like, from most individuals who want to talk about the film Get Out, I wanted to talk about um, deception, um, specifically between intimate partners, rather than just race. 
Um, but of course, how that plays out in, in race as well within the film. And that, you know, article really was referring to my fear of presenting. Um, during that time, it was one of the first opportunities I had to present on a film in front of colleagues who I had known and respected for many, many years. While I was in school, these were like the people I looked up to. And I was basically exposing the fact that I am not just a therapist. I'm not just an assessor. I'm also this person who has this interest in this sort of work. And this is where I'm moving my career towards, actually. And, and I also was anxious about the fact that I had had many meetings with the people who coordinated this event. And we hypothesized, as psychologists do, of what is the audience going to want to talk about and how are they, what are they going to be thinking? And, you know, how will they perceive you as this African-American woman who is presenting about race and in particular um, a relationship between an African-American male and a white woman? And what is it like to be a Black woman speaking about this dynamic or parts of um, the dynamics that exist? And so as we hypothesized all of these things, my anxiety grew and grew and grew. <laughs> um, and luckily, I was able to contain it. Um, and, you know, some anxiety is always good when you're performing. So I was able to reframe it very nicely as well and also know that I was terrified. Um, and it all worked out well. And it was a, one of the hardest experiences of my career thus far. Um, as a tabula rasa, you know, we do talk to our patients about race at times when it comes up, when they bring it up, when it's on the surface. Um, I tend to bring it up in class. Um, I had not brought it up in this way as it re was regarding my aspects of thinking about film, again, with my group of colleagues and, and asking that they think about this in various different ways. Um, a very good experience. And I realize also a part of who I am that really that is my goal. Again, with film in particular, we watch these um, aspects of psychology happening in the displacement. So it's more comfortable for us. Um, and I also, part of my job is to bring those things closer to people to say, again, even though this is entertaining, it's still happening in our lives. Um, I actually found that to happen a second time when we watched Mean Girls per our student request, by the way. <laughs> And they were so like excited to watch it. And it, some people even noted that it was their favorite movie until we talked about how the dynamics of envy doesn't dissipate just because you're out of your teenage years. And suddenly the room became a lot less enthusiastic and much more morose in nature. And they were like, I thought we were over this idea about mean girls. And we're like, no, like, this happens to the best of us of envy and what jealousy is and the difference between the two and how they, one can be more toxic than the other. And I think the idea of bringing these displaced ideas on the screen to people's real lives is, is again, part of the joy of doing this. Yeah, I loved at the end of the article, you said someone in the audience was like, this is difficult to talk about. <laughs> and then they came to you later and they wanted to, to do sort of the similar thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I have to admit when the person says, I don't like what we're talking about here. Albeit I was thinking, yeah, that's the point. Like we're talking about racism and how this manifests in people in, at least in this film in a murderous way. Like no one wants to really think about that. And, and I hope that's something we don't like talking about. And when she did come months later to ask, how can I do something similar? I guess the level of provocation within the room that was hopefully useful was something that um, 
likely happened again when she was able to present. Yeah, I mean, Get Out was such a brilliant, brilliant film. Jordan Peele's ability. Oh my goodness. I, I, you know, I am not a person who likes scary films at all. Like when I didn't want to see Get Out because I had heard it was so suspenseful, that level of anxiety doesn't really entertain me. And I have to admit the first time I watched it, I was with my partner and many times I was like, oh my God, like, you know, just over the top. And it's one of my favorite movies. Um, The detail of dynamics that play out, again, with manipulation, with deceit, um, understood through this lens of race um, and interracial relationships and family dynamics, the idea of belonging and what does that mean? Individuals who are outsiders coming in, what does that mean? What does it mean to have intellectual property and appropriation? It's all within this film and I can keep going, but you know, we have a time limit here um so i mean it's just a a very well done film and certainly a very astute screenplay in itself yeah exactly it's psychologically brilliant and us is psychologically brilliant as well yes also a film where i was like over the top and anxious about it and it's also equally just as brilliant incredible And the other one I really love that I guess came out around the same time was Sorry to Bother You. That was also brilliant. <laughs> okay, right. And you know, so many people have not seen this film, yeah. which is amazing to me. So Boots Riley um, actually, you know, produced and wrote this film and um It is fantastic. The idea of, again, sort of how race is used and what that means and actually modern day slavery is brought into this. Um, You know, I won't tell too much for those who may want to see it. I mean, and it is so well done. Also, you know, I had the opportunity to see um, Boots Riley talk about this film um, in Silver Spring, Maryland, um, where I I met him and I spoke to him and it was a fantastic opportunity to hear what he was thinking when he wrote this film. I I think going to listen to screenwriters and producers and directors talk about their work sometimes lead to more, a lot more information regarding what their perspective was and what they wanted their audience to receive. Um, And it was very interesting, all of the layers that he had taken into account when making Sorry to Bother You. Um, I wish it it, it was more well known because it is such a lovely, I hate to say the word lovely, but it is a lovely depiction of how many people feel, especially now with unemployment, the way that it is. And, you know, this desire of just having other people care for you in some ways, but what does that really mean? And what are you giving up and what that Mm -hmm. looks like? Um, And having that informed consent and understanding as to what you're getting yourself into and what you're willing to do to get ahead and to be okay. Um, Also very well done movie. (laughs) Yeah, I saw it in the theaters twice. <laughs> I was like, this is amazing. And then I went and got my friends and y'all have to come see this film. <laughs> I too saw it in the movies twice. And <laughs> each time, actually both times I went, I said, oh my, I, I see something new each time, which exactly. was really great as well. Um, yeah, it's it's a lovely film. And the actors in it... Um, Lakeith Stanfield um, was in it and he was excellent in that role. Mm-hmm. And Tessa Thompson. Yes, and Tessa Thompson. And actually, you know, Lakeith was also in the film Get Out as well. So, mm-hmm, right in the um, beginning. That's right. Was- so it's like, this is potentially his, a part of his genre is, is, are these films that are entertaining and they have such a strong message regarding what society is going through today and what we've been going through for generations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And should we talk about that and how 
psychoanalysis and psychology can be kind of helpful in this moment. So that's another thing that's always frustrated me in training is that we were actually taught like, don't be political, you know, stay out of politics, stay out of cultural like diagnoses and looking at things through a psychological lens. And I think that's really less than unfortunate. I think it's terrible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, well, you know, we are right now, at least in the States, I feel like we're going through two crises. I mean, one crisis has been perpetuated throughout centuries, um, which is racism. Right now, you know, with Black Lives Matter movement being where it is and so much energy around it, it feels like for people, and including myself, a trauma, one that is acute at this time rather than more um, below the surface. Um, And then, of course, COVID is here. (laughs) Um, And albeit there have been hopes and fantasies that it will just disappear, it looks like it's here to stay for longer than most people desire. Um, And so some of my writing has been about COVID, actually, especially when it first came out, Um, because I was realizing that so many individuals were experiencing it as a crisis, as what it is, but also experiencing it in a very traumatic way, which is certainly an area of my expertise. Um, And so I think, you know, the idea that both of these things are happening at one time and people potentially have more time, you know, if you're staying at home, you have more time to be acutely um, in tune with the media and what's happening, the numbers, how many deaths, how many people, you know, exposed to COVID. You're looking at and being able to see all of the footage of individuals being killed by the hands of police officers. And you're able to see this information over and over and over again, which leads to more traumatic experience. Um, And I also think that these crises happening at the same time also, you know, have a way of interacting with each other. They're not happening in a bubble. So here we are having COVID and this dangerous virus that can take your life. And at the same time, watching on television, Black people's lives being taken. And then what's required and a part of what's required is protesting and demonstrations and, and doing that places you at risk for getting COVID, which can also take your life. So it's like this cycle of how can you be safe? And for someone black in America, that is generally the idea is that there there's this idea of safety, but there's also this knowledge that it is a fantasy as well, that no matter who you are as a Black individual, that you can be someone who is 10, you can be someone seven, you can be someone within your 30s and educated and a doctor, and even so, your life could be taken. And for what we're seeing in media, for reasons that it seems like just are not reasons. It's someone stops you and your life could be lost. And so this idea that there, this lack of safety is there. I mean, if we think about trauma and trauma theory is that in order for an individual to be able to even think about healing, fully healing from their trauma, one has to be safe. And if that does not exist within our environment, for people who look like me, then what does that mean? Now, you know, we've talked about for years now the theory of, you know, people of color, there's always this threat and how that manifests in the way that we live, even how our bodies respond to things and, you know, diseases that we have and things like that. And so I don't think it behooves us to be silent in our therapy sessions with patients who are watching this and having reactions. I'm hopeful that my patients have reactions to what they're seeing. Otherwise, I'd I'd wonder where are they living? I mean, it's all over the media. 
I'm hopeful that they're having reactions. I'm hopeful that they're stirred up. I'm hopeful that it makes them anxious and upset and have very visceral, intense feelings about it. And I also hope that they are using the time and space in the room to be able to work through those feelings and to ensure that they are taking care of themselves in the most healthy way and being able to process and digest what they're seeing and what they're feeling. But to not bring that, I'm sorry, to have that in the room and welcome it when it comes in the room to you. I think it's different if a psychologist brings it into the room for their patients. But if the patients are bringing it into the room, our job is to follow them, yes? So if we're, if we're not choosing to follow them on this path of whatever they're experiencing based upon what's happening in this country regarding race or this world regarding race, then I feel like we're doing a disservice because now we're avoiding and minimizing or denying parts of who they are. And that's not what we we do. And I feel like that would do harm to our patients. I, I just, I feel like it's such a privilege to do what I do. Um, most people ask, um, I actually have a television show called A Healthy Mind. Um, it's a show for um, DC residents and individuals locally on peg stations and it's on YouTube as well. And um, that show helps bring um, guests to talk about expertise and how really, again, everything that we do and, and how we interact is psychologically um, influenced in some way, shape, or form. Um, the goal of this show is to bring information to the general public about psychology. Um, and it's, I started off as a guest and um, became the host about a year ago. And it's been a pleasure to host and actually now co-produce the show. Um, so it definitely gives me that opportunity to be able to be more of my true self and all in, you know, full self. Um, but most people ask if they want to see the show is certainly on YouTube, or you can follow me on psych minded media on Instagram. Um, and there, again, I have the privilege to be able to interview like you're doing actually, um, many individuals, um, within the field of psychology and also other fields. So it's very nice to be able to have, have that, um, opportunity to be able to spread, what psychology is in a way that, again, is accessible to the public and not just to other psychologists as well. How did you become interested in the field of psychology in the first place as an artist? <laughs> Um, albeit I was an artist, I always knew I wanted to be a psychologist. I feel like as long as I can remember, I was very young. And I asked my mom, I said, you know, I want to sit and, and hear what people's problems are and help them. And she, go, she said, you know, maybe you'd like to be a psychologist. And it just stuck. Um, I started researching psychology. I mean, I must have been like 10 or 11 years old. And I started researching the field. Um, I knew this was exactly what I wanted to do. And despite the fact that I was in art school and things like that, um, and even my first jobs actually um, were in the arts as well. Um, but I've been doing this all along. I mean, my first literally job in high school was to teach children cartoon education. And what that was, was that I watched cartoons with them and talked about the morals of the stories and the themes. And I realized that's exactly what I'm doing now when it, when it comes to my writing with film. So I haven't moved much, apparently, from what I love. Um, and luckily, I spent a couple of years in production and studio work as well. So when I had the opportunity to do A Healthy Mind, it was like when I went back to the studio, it was like going home. Um, it certainly was and has been um, a beautiful experience for me to be able to see where I was and where I am now and see those similarities and being again, very much coming full circle. So I knew that psychology was for me. I just didn't know that I would be integrating and marrying my 
desire for arts and media in this way. And so to have that opportunity just has been such a pleasure. (laughs) Yeah, that's wonderful. And I think, like you said, like being able to really be yourself every day, I think that in itself helps your work um, with patients or with clients, because it's just like showing people like to live authentically. And then it helps them to be able to kind of live the way they want to live as well, seeing, seeing you do it, you know? Yeah. It's so funny because, um, I suppose numerous patients know that I also do psych and film. Um, you know, they, I don't share, but they, I suppose, research it to find that out. And the moment they find out, I realize that the therapy changes a bit. They'll say, have you seen this movie? Or, you know, have you seen this television show? Or did you see this in the media? And suddenly their psychological work comes from the displacement. And there's this level of you can identify with me because you've seen it too. And this is what I'm trying to say and trying to articulate. And so we use it a lot as a a very nice therapeutic tool within their work. And I also realize when that happens, that shift begins, is that when some of the most difficult conversations for this person to have begins to happen that because they're able to say, you know, have you seen this film? And this is what this character was going through. And I too was go, I'm going through it as well. And some of these things that they're referring to is what would be considered more taboo or um, idiosyncratic in some way, because I may have seen what they've also seen. Now there's some level or feeling that there's a baseline understanding and an acceptance, because if I've seen it, then I also can accept what I've seen. Um, so I think that for me, I'm also realizing that being in psychology and film with screenwriters it's helpful in that industry, but also when my patients learn that that's an area um, that I work in, it also seems to really um, generate a lot of um, growth within the therapeutic relationship and also within them. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, when I was uh, in training, I went, I finished graduate school in 2007 and then I finished psychoanalytic training in 2013. And of course then I mean, there was the internet and everything, but it wasn't like now. And even like psychoanalytic training, they were like, you can't be on the internet, you can't be on Facebook, all of these things, you have to be invisible, you know, and it's just not realistic at this point. And uh, also, I just think, you know, as long as it's brought in the room, you know, and people can talk about it, or, you know, if they, if they look you up, they say, what do you think about that? Or like, why were you looking? You know, <laughs> like, what's going on? As long as it's kind of analyzed or becomes part of the treatment, like anything else, then I don't really see a problem. Uh, absolutely. I too was trained in the same way, not to be on the internet, you know, you're kind of, like you said, invisible, um, the mystery, again, that blank slate, um, they don't get to know much about you. And, you know, I, I truly also honor that experience. And I do think it's quite useful. I mean, if I think about my therapeutic office, I don't have any of my books in the, in the office. Like there's not, there's no movie posters I've consulted on. Like none of that exists within that space, you know, even though screenwriters do come to my office, I don't um, market that or you know, place that within the, in the space that I'd like my patients to be focused more on them themselves rather than me and what I'm doing. Um, so it's just not at all in the space. And even so, you know, even I do, you know, have a website where I talk about psychology and film. I write, you know, on different blogs, um, which if you Google, you know, me and my name, those things would come up. Um, and I blog on sites because even though, you know, peer reviewed research is fantastic and wonderful ways to contribute to the field of psychology. Again, my main focus is to have psychology, um, be accessible to the general public and people read blogs. Um, They're not necessarily purchasing peer reviewed journals or have even the access to peer reviewed journals, unfortunately, um, unless they're in a 
um, work in a specific domain or, again, can afford to purchase those. Um, so blogs, people read and most of them are free for them. And if it gets them hooked into a way of thinking psychoanalytically about what's happening in their world, um, similar to, you know, this platform of doing a podcast, if this helps bring people to be able to think about um, what happens in their life and what happens in their world in a psychoanalytic way, I feel like we're Again, that's another aspect of doing our work, not just with that one person in the room, but for the community and hopefully society. Yeah, exactly. And it, it like people who aren't necessarily interested in psychology, but are interested in film, they might read the blog because they're interested in that film. And then they get this like great kind of psychoanalytic viewpoint or psych- psychological viewpoint from it. Yes. More people. Yes, um, I that is always a joy. Um, I actually had someone come up to me at a film festival, which was shocking <laughs> um, because I I don't. It just was surprising to me. So I went to Sundance. I've gone a couple of times, and someone there had read one of my blogs and came and recognized me, which like, is what that is for Can me. You do it? <laughs> it's it's always a surprise um to me and and have my own moments of what that's about for me but um they recognized me and said you know they had read a blog about a film that I had written about which was um La La Land and um it was in particular to the character Sebastian which was acted by um Gosling. Um, his first name is um, Ryan Gosling. Me. Yes, Ryan Gosling. Thank you. Um, and it was about really how, again, to honor yourself and when do you give up on yourself? Um, when do you give up on your hopes and dreams? And how do you have the level of persistence even when things seem to just be going disastrously in your life and, and not very well? Um, and if this is a dream, what do you do with it? How can you um, actualize it? And the person said to me, you know, they were a filmmaker and they said, you know, I, I was at my end's wit. Like, I just did not want to do this anymore. And nothing was coming through for me. I had been doing this for years. I, they went to, you know, school to become a screenwriter. So, and they had student loan debt, all of these things. And it just wasn't panning out. And people were saying to them, it was time to just give it up. And they said they read the blog and, and looked and they said they never wanted to see La La Land, but then they watched La La Land because they read the blog. Um, and they said, you know, I just, I, suddenly I just said, you know, I have to engross myself. If this is the world I want to be in, I, I need to engross myself and find my place in it. And they said, you know, I came to Sundance. And even though things are still a little shaky, like things, it wasn't a rainbow and sunshine story. They said things are shaky, like financially things are shaky. But they said, you know, I'm happy I've decided to still plant my feet here um, in this world because this is the world I really want to be in. Um, And so it definitely made me feel like, okay, someone's reading this and yes hopefully they're able to think about how this person in this film things weren't going great for him but he still made what life he wanted to for himself even though it took a long time and a lot of sacrifices and and circumstances for him to go through and hopefully that's what this does is not just give someone inspiration but gives a person the ability to use what we know theoretically as psychologists and be able to say and be able to examine themselves and who they may be through this character. Um, and hopefully they enjoy La La Land too. <laughs> at the same and time. what an amazing sync though, that they decided to go to Sundance to like reassert themselves in this like world that they wanted to be in. And then they saw you there who had written this piece that kind of helped them, inspired them to do that. 
That's incredible, yeah. actually. <laughs> it was. And in Sundance, I mean, they chose certainly the right film festival to do that. I mean, that experience is very much a hundred percent around you while you're there. So I mean, the amount of people hopefully this person was able to connect with. I mean, the idea that they came up to me to communicate definitely showed me that they're out there. They know how to communicate with other people. They're networking, you know. It was a phenomenal experience to be a part of that person's journey. Um, it, it was it was just phenomenal. <laughs> yeah, I really love like things like that. And I really feel like people... I hope people are open to to noticing those things and those kinds of connections and like having that help them feel like motivated and supported in continuing on in their journeys, you know? Yes, exactly. You know, it's interesting when these sorts of things happen of um, those connections that are placed in these anchors, you know, I got the sense that this person was happy in, in their experience at Sundance, but hopefully being able to see that, wow, this is the person who wrote this blog that got me there, maybe a little more fuel to keep them going too. Um, you know, I'm just hopeful that these blogs that I write are, you know, I always think they're, they're, they're going to help someone internally. Um, I never think about per se all of the ways that it's going to shift and manifest potentially in their behaviors. Um, but to have someone say, I, I, you know, I came to Sundance again, things are shaky, but I'm going to do this. I think is such a huge um, investment and dedication to themselves to hopefully get them to where they really want to be. And what your, and what your mentor did, like having you imagine what you would love your life to be like if you could do anything with it, you know, um, that step and like being able to imagine it because I, f- I feel like I do that a lot with uh, the people I see is just like, well, what, what would you like your day-to-day life to look like if it could be however, you know, it's just like helping people kind of think out of their normal way of thinking so they can imagine something like bigger or, or different for themselves, you know. Yes, I, I I definitely start off intake sessions um, like that as well as what is the person's utopia? Now, granted, that may not exist, but let's just have a moment to fantasize. And many adults in general, I realize, um, don't necessarily give themselves the liberty to fantasize or dream in the same way. I mean, I think as children and youngsters, we dream quite frequently, Um and I mean, our conscious dreams. <laughs> um, I think that we do that quite frequently and say, you know, when we get older, we want to be, or this is what we want to do, or this is what we imagine adult life to look like. But once we're an adult, some individuals quite frequently feel trapped that what they're doing now is what they have to do for the remainder of their days. And we know differently. Um, And even though it may be hard to get to that utopian way of thinking or even living, the opportunity is still there for people. Um, And to be able to be a part of that in the psychology world for, you know, our patients or even our screenwriters, which I also find happens quite frequently in people's writing, is that, you know, people think about their characters And they think about them in specific ways. And then if I also ask that same question of if this character could have anything, it kind of shifts the way they think about their character and opens them up to be more complex than than how maybe they were first imagined to be. Um, So I feel like that, that idea, what do you want to do or what could, what can you potentially do and what would you want to do just opens up such a large door of possibility without limitations. Now, granted, we can then put those on. We certainly will because we live in this world of reality. There'll be limitations, but if we were to think outside of that, what could be possible? Um, And to be able to offer that to others and my mentor offering that to me, yeah, I, I again, it's just when I say it's a privilege, I realize how much of a privilege that is to have that opportunity. Um, many people's circumstances are not such where they have that privilege to be able to think that they could do anything because of the demands of what their life has. 
And I also don't take for granted that my ancestors and generations prior to me, that certainly was not a privilege that was afforded to them. And so I definitely, um, when I say it's a privilege, I feel that, that in this living in this time um, and having what I have and the options that I have, it truly is a privilege. Yeah, I really appreciated reading that in your article as well, where you talked about uh, your ancestors and kind of the generations that came before you. Um, Because I think thinking that way would be also very useful in this moment for all of us to kind of think of that. Um, I think of the history collectively and individually in our families and kind of try to heal those traumas and be very kind of aware of them, always putting that in the forefront and then also appreciating to our ancestors all the work that they did and all the trials and tribulations they went through to kind of bring us all here today. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, I truly believe that we are a collective. You know, I know that it's it can be enticing to think of ourselves as individuals, but, and we are, of course, and we are also part of a collective, in my opinion. And who I am is a product of my parents who, again, have had the privilege of having in my life in the way that I have them in my life um, and very fortunate experiences with them. And I'm the product of all of my family that I know and who are immediately available to me, the ones that I don't know and who are absent for whatever reasons, and the ones who were not available to me because they were not alive. I mean, all of these individuals have influenced who I've had an opportunity to become. I have not been created in a bubble either, in a vacuum. Um, And so all of these influences of my ancestors and also other people's ancestors as well. You know, the wonderful thing about being able to meet the number of people that I get to meet, I then am influenced by them and their ancestors and how they've influenced them. So we are all a part of this collective, shall I say. Um, and I take that with me when I think about my de- the decisions that I'm making is, you know, the article happens to be titled something that I say to myself quite frequently, what is my part? Um, and when I think about that, you know, every decision I'm making when it comes to psychology and just personally as well is what is my part and what part do I want to play in this and what part don't I want to play? What part do I still feel like I have to play despite if I want to or not? Um, And for what service? And, you know, many times, sometimes it is a burden to play and to have those um, roles, um, in the part that I feel like it's important for me to play. And I also know it's an act of privilege when I don't have to anymore, or I can leave that to someone else to that. That's their role. Um, And I'm very conscious of that. You know, what is my part right now? And not just for me, but also for my ancestors and for the people who look like me to come. If I don't do this right now, what does that mean for people, for my child, for my children, for their children, for generations to come? Because I do have a privilege and the ability to say something and to do something. And if I don't do it, what effect might that have? Thank you for listening to Rendering Unconscious. You've just heard a discussion with Dr. Katherine Marshall Woods. For more, please visit links accompanying this episode and be sure to check out A Healthy Mind. Rendering Unconscious is also a book. Rendering Unconscious, Psychoanalytic Perspectives, Politics, and Poetry. Available from Trapart Books, 2019. Please visit our publisher's website, www.trapart.net. 
You can support the podcast by visiting our Patreon, p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash v-a-n-e-s-s-a two three c-a-r-l. Your support is greatly appreciated. For more information, you can visit my website, drvanessasinclair.net, or the podcast website, renderingunconscious.org. Feel their texture and look closely at them. Notice if, if there are any animals within the cave. A bat sleeping, the side of the wall. Walk further and further into thee than a tiny light. Take another deep breath and put step. Go further and further until it becomes so dark, slowly. In the distance, you see a small light, and you, closer, it begins to get bigger and brighter until you make your way to the exit, until you are right there, repositions, enacting an especially recognized Fool drew in your and conversations, helpful in, just inspire, entitled Panthropology, and apparent, utilized to reprogram ourselves, inventing collaborations from the very first cut-ups, be put on par with production of new, get to the gallery because they say they ship because it has a lot of pieces and I get there and they say, oh, you didn't. Alas, he left a of the primeval. Kabula, the session, came to a close.